name is Bear Siragusa, and you are listening to the Hunting Hound Podcast presented by W Hunting Supply. All right. Well, it is early morning here and late night over there what time is it there is it nine mm. nine thirty quarter to ten something like that yeah quarter to ten yeah it's quarter to six here in the morning so, so in other words neither one of us can start yawning because we're going to set the other one off <laughs> right basically is what's going to happen i'm going to be <laughs> so but yeah well thanks for coming on it's been uh the last time we talked what did we talk about the last time? Last time we talked about, wasn't it traveling? Gosh, it's hard to keep. Wasn't it traveling, yeah, camp, yep. camping with dogs? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And today we're going to make a bunch of friends by giving our opinions about breeding. <laughs> just yeah. making friends everywhere I go. Just making friends <laughs> everywhere we go. No, it's it's something you and I have talked about a bunch before and and uh something I've been thinking about quite a bit recently because of some yeah. Uh most people know I guess that I work as a veterinary nurse and uh we get people into work doing breeding, you know, with their pregnant females or trying to get them pregnant or whatever. And uh yeah can't go into any details but there's some there's some there's some questionable practices in amongst the uh the pet breeding people and to be fair the <laughs> the working dog the working dog people as well i uh i don't know what would have made me had a stroke career wise first if i had pursued wildlife management or mm. vet med as i was thinking <laughs> yeah you know you see it, it's you got to have a pretty thick skin. Like you got to, it's got, you got to be just be able to like just shrug it off and move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. You know, either that or a short attention span. It's like, that's terrible. Oh, look, a puppy. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where, you know, people are going to come in with, you know, issues that, I mean, half of the, half of the things we see are issues that the owners themselves have caused Mm -hmm. by you know overfeeding or yeah one of the funny ones is like ear infections caused by giving them like multiple baths a week that's like a thing over bathing your dog there's people that have a whole lot more energy out there than i do (laughs) Yeah, energy and time like who, who's who got the time like you know i mean uh, granted i guess when you've got one dog that helps <laughs> right when you're not you don't bathing 20 hounds yeah it's basically a waterboarding session with a garden hose and some dish soap <laughs> right right right, right. <laughs> like i remember i had to uh I had to help some friends flea or was it flea dip? It was, I guess it was lice, like a lice dip. The their sled dog kennel, and um, we filled a flat bottom canoe with with water and oh spent the entire day, and it was just like the Thunderdome from start to finish. It was just all, it was awful. Oh my God. Yeah. You could have sold tickets to that. If they're anything like Al, cause he oh will gladly God. wait up to his chest, but that is the only terms he's getting wet on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, oof. that was, that was crazy. Who ended up with more flea dip on him? You or the dogs? Well, I still haven't gotten fleas. So I think it was me. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, one of the one of the things with uh with breeding, I haven't 
done a lot of breeding with, uh, or any breeding at all with, um, with the hounds, but did, um, you know, had a, my own breeding program here with, uh, with the Huskies for, yeah, 15, 15 years. And, um, and that started out of necessity because I moved here with a bunch of dogs from Maine that were just not equipped to deal with the conditions over here. Neither the cold or the, um, just the rough, the rough terrain, deep, you know, the, the degree of deep snow without, um, you know, without the snowmobiles and things like that. Um, and the dogs that were being used over here were not exactly what I was looking for either. They were good dogs. There was nothing wrong with them. It's just not, not what I was looking for specifically. So I had to breed to find what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, found that there are, there is such an enormous difference between what looks good on paper and what actually makes sense. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially now with the wonders of the internet and how easy it can be to falsify papers. Right. Whether that's in the horse industry or the dog industry, or you know, you give anyone long enough with some Photoshop and an idea, and yeah, you know, one thing I, I had kind of wondered—I meant to ask you a while back—what elevation are you at over there? Do you notice a difference when you brought your dogs from 500 foot elevation in Maine to, I would assume, several thousand feet in Norway? There was that part of the issue as well. Um, no, not, not necessarily. The, we're actually not that high, uh, at where we are right here. Um, you know, we're, or I should, I shouldn't say that we're a couple of thousand feet up, but nothing, nothing huge. Um, and I didn't notice any real difference. You know, we, we can get way above the tree line pretty quick, but I think that's more to do with how far North we are than Mm -hmm. how high we are because the house is, is going to be, I guess we're at, what'd that be? We're not that high at, at, at the house. Um, you know, a few thousand feet and then you get up onto the plateau and you know, then, then you're at like three, 3000 plus, you know, without, without, any issues. Oh, so, wow. so you're still fairly low then. Fairly low. Yeah. It's, you know, nor the thing with Norway is it's not like a gradual, you know, gradually turns into mountains. It's like, you know, ocean two feet and then mountains. Fair enough. Yeah. So, um, the elevation's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be that kind of gradual, turning into epic mountains, like, you know, living up Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I didn't notice that much of a difference there. The biggest, the biggest thing, the the, the biggest things that I noticed was, was um, their ability to deal with the cold, but also, uh, also their ability to break trail. Cause that's what I needed. I live in a place where to get into, to get into broken trail system, I needed to break trail. I needed to hold open a section of trail just with dog, just with a dog team. That was about 10 miles long. Oh, okay. Um, and where the elevation gain was. Yeah. uh, 2000 feet, maybe of elevation gain to get into that trail system from where, from our place. Um, and the dogs I brought with me just were not were not equipped to deal with it. Um, and you know I could go and you know what I initially did is I, I drove around and 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 bought up uh, dogs that looked like they could from decent lines from a bunch of different people. So I had this kind of mix matched 
team that were kind of similar, but a lot of similar, a lot of dissimilar genetics until I found exactly what I was looking for, what I wanted and what I was looking for. And then, um, you know, had to, did all the mistakes that everybody does, you know, bred the dog that I really liked that had some weaknesses or bred to, you know, a buddy's dog because it was, Oh, it's amazing. You know, we're really, really good. Amazing. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and found that I was just not getting anything. I was getting dogs, but it was not with the kind of consistency that I wanted to, you know, I get one or two out of a litter, maybe. And, you know, had a couple of litters where I, it was just a complete waste of my time. But, you know, I don't know what you what you find with, uh, you know, when you're when you're breeding hounds, you know, you, do you find that do you find that taking chances trying something new that that works fairly frequently for you or is it more of a like what are your criteria for trying for doing something my criteria as far as why i pick the dogs i pick or make the crosses i say we um you know we cleve and i don't necessarily make a ton of crosses. I I try to make the way I try and look at things, um, is my criteria for saying, okay, this pairing is, I look at it as if obviously I, I can do it more than this, but say if I only had an opportunity to breed one time in five years mm. and I had to keep those dogs and make a pack out of them, what cross is that going to be? Obviously I can cross more than that. Um, but I try to do a ton of culling before I breed Mm -hmm. just in the aspect of, Nope, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. Not actually physically culling, but Nope, you're getting cut. You're getting spayed, whatever. Right. You Um, remove them from your breeding pool. Yeah. Yeah. Because oftentimes, even as much as the good characteristics come through, so don't the bad ones. So it's a matter of, what you can live with, what I can live with, somebody else might not be able to, what Glee can live with, somebody else might not be able to, and, and, and vice mm-hmm. versa. Um, I think it's different too if you're turning out puppies that you're keeping everything or mm-hmm. you're turning them out to the public because if you're only keeping one or two, you have to make sure everybody else still likes theirs as well. Otherwise, right. you're going to wind up with 25 dogs. <laughs> um, right. But, you know, that's kind of the criteria I look at. And there's some things that I might be willing to say, okay, I can live with that flaw because I think we can, we can transition that out through Mm -hmm. other crosses. Um, You know, I've got a dog right now, a young male that's just turning out to be like the type where I'm not like, yeah, yeah, this is good. You know, I'd like more of that. It's I have to have more of that. I have to have that. Um, He has a structural... He's a little weaker in his hawks than I would like, Mm -hmm. but they don't bother him. I've never seen him take an off step about it. He just, when he really stretches out, they go lax a little more than I would like. But when he stands square, they're fine. His siblings are all super tight hawked. And for me, his pros outweigh that in the fact that I think I could cross that right out pretty dang quick um, if it even showed up. So that's some of it too is, man, you've got to look at, at their structure. I mean, if the dog you're thinking about breeding is well bred, but has the physical capabilities in their feet to outswim a beaver, maybe look for some, someone that has a sibling that's also turned out well, but is built a little better. Um, right. You know, or, and I mean, it just depends on what's important to the breeder too, you know? Right. You know, it's, it's, and I think that that's a good point that you need to, you, when you go into breeding, you need to know what you're shooting for. You know, the mm-hmm. good dogs is, it's too vague. 
you've got to have a good idea of what you're what you're going for, the qualities that you want, both physically and um, performance wise. And as you say, uh, you know, a big part of that is also just being f- keenly aware of the weaknesses because you will ha- you will not be able to breed a dog that does not have weaknesses. But it's got to be it, it it's going to need to be something then that you can cope with. Mm-hmm. And a lot of uh, times I think people don't think too. oh, the parents, the parents, the parents. If you look at it, a lot of times dogs will take after. You know, the, the production of those parents will take more after the grandparents mm-hmm. than directly the parents. So it's, it's not, and no, not everybody has the ability to do that, to say, oh, well, so-and-so had the grandparents or I had the grandparents or, you know, if you're just starting out, sometimes you got to go with what you got and say, well, this is the best I've got right now. So I'm just going to mm-hmm. keep going up from here. But the goal should always be to make a better product than the parents, not just a repeat or, Absolutely. or good enough, you know? Right. Right. It's just, what's that level of quality per person, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. You know, what's, what's going to be good enough for me may not be good enough for you. And, you know, it's, 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 I've had, you know, yeah. One of the, one of the things that I've thought quite a bit about in the past is, is, you know, I know a lot of people, the, serious breeders, a lot of them will line breed. Mm -hmm. And I believe that part of that, or I mean, obviously part of that is to get some kind of um, predictability in their, in their breeding program that they kind of know to a degree what they're going to get to a larger degree than if they were just breeding kind of like bringing in, you know, doing outcrosses every, every breeding. But doing that, you you do end up with some. That that's a case of diminishing returns. You know, each generation that you really hard line breed is going to be. It may have the qualities that you want, but that's also going. You're going to be doubling down on some of the bad qualities, some of the hidden health problems, that kind of stuff. Um. So you know, I never. <laughs> I never wanted to do the lion breeding aspect of things because I suspect I suspected and I still suspect that part of the success of lion breeding is the predictability mm-hmm. that they're breeding because they're lion breeding. They're breeding to dogs that are doing what they want to do the way they want to do it. And that kind of became the basis for my breeding program is that I became, I was known for being incredibly picky for reasons that no one else understood than, than I, you know, that I knew what I was going for. I knew what I was breeding for. And, you know, uh, people around me that just thought I was completely out of my, you know, completely out of my mind. Because, you know, the, the, the in thing right now is, you know, really lightly built long legs, you know, super fast, kind of small, you know, and that just did not suit me at all, mm-hmm. you know, cause those dogs just are not capable of trail breaking to the degree that I needed them to trail break. Sure. They can do it. It's, you know, that's no, no question but they can't do it day after day after day after day and not a mentally break and b physically break down. Right. For sure. So it became, you know, it, it became, and it was actually, it was funny because it was the, you'd think, Oh, you got to be honest with yourself. Oh, that's easy. It's not, it's so hard to be brutally honest with yourself and say, you know, I really like this dog, but, he is going to bring qualities that I, I'm not going to be able to compensate for or, you know, beautiful dog, you know, amazing attitude, blah, blah, blah. But he's not, he doesn't run the way I want him to run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, 
I, I always was super, super deliberate about making sure that I was, that when I brought a dog from outside that I was breeding to, you know, I had some criteria that were important to me, you know, it was the, the length of the leg, the length of the back. I couldn't have them too short backed or they wouldn't be able to put their feet in the next, they, they'd kind of get, you know, choppy as they were mm-hmm. pulling, um, and working real hard, but you know, some size to be able to plow through the snow. They need to have a coat that could handle the conditions. They need to eat really, really well. I don't like shy dogs. So that took that immediately removed them from the gene pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted dogs that were once we were done trail breaking could shake it off and settle into, you know, settle into a traveling pace that was, you know, realistically never going to be the same traveling pace on hard pack trail that these super light, fast dogs were able to do, but they could do it for days and days and days and days and days. Right. So, you know, I said no to a bunch of just absolutely beautiful dogs that there was nothing wrong with them. And, you know, it's one of those things where you try to, you, you, people get offended about it. You know, even if you try to be like, Oh, it's gorgeous. It's not really what I'm looking for. People are like, well, God, you know, damn it. May as well, yeah. You may as well have told them their kids ugly. <laughs> right. It's exactly, exactly, exactly right. It's like, well, it's, you know, uh, it's a good looking kid, not my type, but, you know, it's like, it's like but yeah, this is why I shouldn't be allowed out in public. That's, <laughs> why I live up in a mountain all by myself. But, you know, when you know, you've done a lot of you guys have done a lot of these, you know, people want to call them experimental, but they're not really crosses where you've done the beagle, you know, the crosses with the beagles and things like that. Um, you know, I, you and I have talked a little bit about it. There's actually an enormous amount of work that goes into choosing which beagles you're crossing in. It's not just, you're not just rolling down to, you know, the first, um, b- cottontail hunter you find and, <laughs> and <laughs> grab, grabbing the first and best beagle, you know? Yeah. And they're, they're few and far. <laughs> far between out here you know i was actually getting ready to wait for a female to come in and drive to cedarville or no that's california cedar town georgia oh wow cedar cedar point and something like that um i think right now what i'm gonna do is actually in probably a year or so get a pup from that kennel um, but mm-hmm. in the meantime, I'm looking at maybe making another cross. Now, going back to the line breeding stuff, that is something where I think in our program, um, that's going to help establish a consistent type versus, okay, this dog took more after the beagle side, this dog took more after the hound side. It'll it'll help establish a little more consistent body type. Um, so far, mm-hmm. they're trailing has all been just everything I want. The mentality has been everything I want. Um, we want whatever. Um, but I think that will, that'll help a little bit. And obviously you have to be careful with the line breeding and there is a formula to it. You make, you make certain crosses where you can actually bang your clone, the dog that you have. Um, but you do need to make sure you're doing out crosses and, and not getting you know, not having the branches on the family tree be straight up and down. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, then you really do get into, my God, your kid is ugly. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it comes down to what you have available, too. I mean, a guy who's just getting into it, who's been into it three or four years, is not going to have the same context that somebody is who's been in it for 20 years. And it might, it might be different in different worlds, too. You know, I think... Um, dogs are studded out more readily to the public in say the competition human hunting world versus 
you know, say dirt lion dogs. Um, it's just a different, different, different animal. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. No pun intended, but, and not that one's better than the other. It's just, Things yeah. and it's a little harder when you're spread out so far, like we are out west too. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's certain places and clusters of areas that have more hunters where you have easier access. But I mean, for the most part, if I'm going to make an outside cross, I'm looking at driving anywhere from um, ten hours to. Mm -hmm. Cedar, whatever, Georgia. <laughs> right. To, to everything between 10 hours and Georgia. Yeah. Well, you know, but that's, I think that's how you got to do it. And, and, you know, you've, when you're getting into something like this, your, your point is a good one that, you know, you don't have the context necessarily, uh, that are, that are, you're not necessarily going to have the ability to breed to the quality of dog that you want to, but also, you know, it's, and uh, you're not going to have the knowledge necessary to do, to make, you know, good decisions based on, you know, on, on what to breed. You may get lucky, but you know, it's, it takes a lot of time to, learn what you need to know to to be able to make these the, these calls about breeding and have them work out you know it's you know and i've then, had go ahead and then hope the litter doesn't die right hope the litter doesn't die hope the female's okay hope that you don't you know you didn't miss something you know uh <laughs> And when you don't have the experience, it's so easy to do. And it's also so easy to be, you know, just kind of, yeah, taken advantage of at that point. Well, and I mean, you know, if they're dogs that shouldn't be crossed, they're going to have 25 a litter and every one of them suckers is going to live and go have right. 25 of their own. And, you know, it's only the ones you really want that end up having <laughs> tragedy strike all the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's the, the import parent. Yeah. Ugh, I could talk. I think the real key, oh, I shouldn't, nope. I'm not going to go there. Well, I think, you know, as far as selecting the parents, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at what they are themselves and have, you know, be really honest about what you're looking at. Um, you also have to be very aware, obviously what the parents are doing and things like that. But one thing that I was very, very aware of is what are their siblings, the parents, what are their siblings doing? What do they look like? You know, cause I had, <clears throat> I've got a dog. He's, he's old as hell now, but, um, you know, when I got him, I was like, man, this dog is just, he's everything that I'm looking for. Um, just everything I was looking for. Um, just, yeah, really, really, really nice dog. And, um, you know, started thinking about breeding him, was looking into his genetics and, you know, his father was exact, you know, really similar to what I was looking for. And, you know, so his father's side was really solid mother. I was kind of a little bit like, well, I'm not a hundred percent sure about the mom, but you know, it through this. So I wonder what his siblings look like. So I went to, you know, the kennel where he was bred and looked at his siblings and it turns out that he was the freak from the litter. He was the, <clears throat> big, well-furred social butterfly with iron feet amongst a bunch of short-coated, <clears throat> pardon me, short-coated, you know, bad eaters who were shy. And 
you know, then that removed him ultimately from my breeding program because, you know, he may be everything that I was looking for. I mean, two, uh, he's, he's probably, you know, one of the top three most perfect dogs that I've had, but he was not, I, I am in not at all confident that he was going to throw copies of himself and not copies of any one of his seven siblings. Right. And, and you have, go ahead. You have to look at, even if they throw the best, what's the worst they're going to throw. Right. And just because, I mean, I've seen dogs that will just jam up sons of guns and it didn't matter what you crossed them with. They did not produce. Mm-hmm. Anything. I mean, I mean, they produce dogs that made dogs, but that's all they were. And it's it's nothing against them. Sometimes those bloodlines just there's just something there that doesn't pass on. And... Right. Yeah. I mean, some some super dogs just never produce. Um, and it's something that. You know, when I had the opportunity to do it, which I I cannot think of, realistically, I can't think of an example of when I didn't have that opportunity. And it's going to be different with the sled dogs. I'm aware of that. You know, where I always had the opportunity to see what the dogs produced before I bred to them myself. You know, if I saw a dog that I liked, I would wait until that dog got bred and then see what those pups looked like first. Right. Yep. You know, it was so rare. and I don't actually think it ever, I don't, yeah, it actually never, never happened. I guess the last 10 years, it didn't happen here where I bred to dogs that hadn't been bred before. Um, or that's not true. A, cu- a couple of females, I suppose. But <clears throat> with the hounds, we don't necessarily have that luxury. You know, the sled dogs, they're, they're going to be fine. The chances that something crazy happens and where they remove themselves from the gene pool before you have the chance to breed to them is pretty low. The hounds, it's a different deal. Yeah, you know, you're kind of good at self-deleting. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you've, if you've got a dog that you're thinking, I probably, re- I would really like to see what this dog produces, you probably should, you know, not everybody's got the, you know, access to a veterinarian that does it or the money or what, you know, whatever to collect that dog just in case. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different deal with the hounds where you've got to kind of be willing to take that risk. But, you know, I think, you know, your, your attitude of going into it with this attitude where, I'm, I'm stuck with these guys. This is the only thing I'm going to do for the next five years. And even if that's not true, going into it with that attitude of like, am I going to be okay working with, you know, the worst qualities of the mom and dad for the next five years? It's a, I mean, it's a great way to look at it. It can also drive you insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Might we've, explain we've all... a lot about me. <laughs> <laughs> it explains a lot about dog people in general. I've definitely <laughs> been standing there with this look of horror on my face and just thinking, what have I done? What have, what have I done? <laughs> but, yeah. <clears throat> you know, and I, I think that, you know, what you're talking about, being willing to go to to go the distance to do the work to get a hold of the good breeding animals you know like what you're talking about driving to driving to Georgia to get a dog bred not a lot of people would do it and but if you want consistent good genetics you know the the more the more you're willing to put into it, 
the uh, the better off you're going to be. The chances that your neighbor has exactly what you're looking for, it's it's happened, you know. But it's it's rare. <laughs> it usually doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think a guy needs to pay attention if he's breeding the same line over and over too. What is the dominant? trait there's a strain of big game dogs out here um i've tried a couple i know folks who have kennels full who love them who have done amazing with them Mm -hmm. um and there i have to wonder if there wasn't a point a literal pointer in the woodshed uh way way far back there because there is a extremely dominant gene coloring wise i mean they stick out like a sore thumb where you're like that dog looks like a short hair Mm -hmm. and you can call them almost every time as to what that dog goes back to so it's like what causes that one gene that that's so prominent over 20 30 years of someone's program over over whatever there um and and it turned out really good dogs in that arena you know uh I mean, even those dogs that have been outcrossed, there's still that that gene shows up there, um, right? You know, and whether that's physicality, ease of birthing, lack of problems, uh, mothering instinct, obvious mm-hmm. physical stuff, you know, build, what are they feeling that way, temperament, all of that. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> no, I mean it's. <sighs> that's the the scary part about the breeding, right? Is that you're going to, you're going to have things that your line is going to have stuff that you may not care about, but it, you're going to have it with you anyway. You know, you may have a, you know, a color like you're talking about from 40 generations ago that becomes a defining characteristic of your line. And you don't care about the color necessarily. But, you know, it, it stayed with you. And, you know, I, again, I, I think it's one of those things where the, when I'm talking to working dog people, I can more understand it with the horses choosing based off of color or coat or, you know, whatever the working dog people. I don't, you know, if you're not doing purebreds, which, you know, uh, uh, do whatever floats your boat. But, you know, I, I do not understand. I've, um, you know, getting into the border, some border collie stuff at this point. And it's super in right now with the red border collies. Oh, okay. Over here. And there's this color variation between the red and the, um, like the dun, which is almost like a purple. Border Collie, they're striking dogs, and th- some of them are very, very good. There's a um, there's a gal over in Scotland uh, named Emma Gray, who who breeds, who who's got a extremely good uh, dog that is that has that coloring. Um, but people are choosing based off of color, and they're breeding based off of color, and that drives me crazy. That always drove me crazy with the Alaskan Huskies too. Is like, you know, there you've got a pure working dog, and then you start, ch- you know, picking and choosing based off of stuff like, you know, something arbitrary that has nothing to do with performance or overall health. Blue eyes. <laughs> yeah, blue eyes. You know the that sort of uh, raccoon, you know, Siberian Husky mask that people like so much and you know um you know or like i knew i knew or i know of an iditarod guy that you know he only ran white dogs and it was just the dumbest thing like you know to be like it was just dumb yeah and it's fine to have preference i mean don't don't get me wrong when i went out looking for a sled dog i was like i love i'm probably gonna butcher this but i love that agouti color where it's the you know, the dark browns and the blacks and all that. And I ended up with mm-hmm. one that's all white with a 
I guess not a beauty color mask, you know, and it was like, oh, the one time I'm not going to have to worry about breeding it. So I might actually go for color. And like you said that, you know, one of the dogs I'm considering breeding is a very striking, uh, tricolor with a black saddle back. And I'm guessing that'll probably be a dominant, a dominant color that comes out of him. Mm Mm-hmm. What I worry about color more is if they're very dark, how is that, how is the heat going to affect them? Right. Um, but yeah, that, that should be like, you know, and I, like you were saying, going back to the horses, okay, you can look at it and say, okay, this stud has the alphabet soup of color genes. I mean, with, that's a whole other podcast on its own. That's what the mayor mm. has. So they're going to, you know, that offspring is going to be a dun or a buckskin or a, a smoky black or whatever. Right. That's different than with dogs. I mean, like you said, when you start breeding strictly for color with dogs, there's a lot of, and I shouldn't even say it's different, but there's a lot of other things that go by, go by the wayside. And next thing you know, you've got blue, marl, long haired French bulldogs with one blue eye. And right. Breeding problems and they're 10 grand. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, yeah, I get I, I get skeptical when you start choosing based off of things that are not performance or health based. You know, it's and but when I say performance, I mean performing the way you want to be performing. I had a really interesting conversation with um a guy that put an enormous amount of time and money into his into his genetics. He would travel to he would travel from Norway to the States. I mean, yeah, multiple times a year. And he always brought dogs back with him and they were not just random dogs. They were the, they were the dogs off of the highest performing from the highest performing kennels from that year. So he would, you know, if, if they had won something that he cared about, he would go and buy a dog, not just a dog from that genetics, but a dog off of that group of winning dogs and bring them back. And, you know, he was, his attitude was that was the way to get the best dogs, you know, (laughs) was to, was to breed to the best of the best of the best of the best. And I understood why he thought that, but he, what he, I think he failed to understand was that there are so many ways to roam. There are so many roads to roam. And, you know, if you compared some of those dogs, it was like they were, they were, they could have, they, they were all the same breed, but they could have been different breeds. Yeah. They were so different. And what he ended up with was, you know, breeding dogs that, you know, went really, really fast, but then required a lot of rest to dogs that required almost no rest, but, you know, we're going at 65% output the whole time, you know, and got a mix of those things and never really was super competitive because he was never able to put together a team that was, you know, where, where everybody was functioning at the same level at the same time in the same way. Yeah, that's tough. And, you know, my attitude was always to breed to the dogs that are doing, if I went outside my kennel, I wanted to breed to a dog where both the dog, the grandparents and the siblings of those dogs were doing what I wanted to be doing the way I wanted to be doing it. And I think especially, you know, when we're talking like the dry ground guys, where there's not, you don't have the competition statistics. You know, you're not getting the, the, you know, the, the letters and b- before their names, you know, it, it's, I can imagine that it would almost be easier in that way to remain consistent than with like the, the, the coon hound guys or the, or, you know, the, the competition guys who you know, maybe looking at what a dog has accomplished more closely than how that dog worked to accomplish those things. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. And there can even, there can even be a fair amount of variation in there just because 
not all lions are the same hunt in one state's different, different than another. But as long as you know, you know that, and you're looking, even though you're looking to make improvements, you still need to find something that's going to complement what you have. Otherwise, like you said, you wind up with a bunch of stuff that's just kind of scattered all over the place and, and they may all have their individual strengths, but if those individual strengths don't complement each other, then you, you just got a kind of bunch of one off. Yep. Kind of hard to put a football team together if everybody's going in the other opposite direction, but still doing their best. You know what I mean? Does right. that kind of make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's you know, another thing that I see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that, that's another thing I see that it, I shouldn't say it frustrates me because it really, it's just like, well, whatever it's social media, you know, but I see a lot of new guys catching, catch slack saying, Oh, you know, bread is better than bought. Not necessarily. Not when I'd you're rather, starting out. I, yeah. And I, you know, and I've made the comments, people say, Oh, people might take good dog and ruin it. Well, they might, but there's a whole lot better chance if they breed something that's not really worth breeding. You have a lot more chance of turning out a mediocre puppy at best, starting from just a green puppy than you do really ruining an actual great dog. So you know what? Take that, spend the money, spend the time, take that great dog, learn what a great dog is. And then if you have the opportunity, breed that great dog to another great dog. And then you can start your real learning process from there once you have a foundation under you. But you're not going to build something solid on a weak foundation that just, right. it rarely, I shouldn't say you can't, but it very rarely works out that way. I mean, you can, but it's going to be an enormous amount of work, uh, to get, you know, to, to shore up that foundation as you're building. Yeah. You know, once you get something terrible in your line, it's, it's so hard to get it out of there. You know, it's so hard to get it out of there to the point where I did, I did, I, I bred a couple of dogs that I thought looked really nice. Their siblings were really nice. Parents were really nice. Like I had clicked all the box, checked all the boxes that I was going for. Um, you know, and parents were reason, you know, fairly young, five, five years old, maybe. Um, I did the breeding and pups came out, looked really, really nice. By the time the parents were seven years old, they had both retired. Um, all wow. of their, all of the parents, siblings retired by the time they were seven. And uh, two, uh, with the exception of one dog, I had two full litters, um, off of these lines and with, so what would that be? I guess it was 13, 13 dogs between these two litters. And with the exception of one, all of them retired by the time they were seven years old, which is, you know, three, four years before they should be retiring. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. And, and it was a mental thing. Mm -hmm. They just, they hit a point and it was, and it was fascinating to watch because it wasn't like they started kind of being mediocre and kind of, a, you know, eventually I just couldn't, didn't want to deal with it anymore. It's like if, to the last dog and it got to the point where it was like a genetic thing where I would, I would see it and be like, damn it, this, this, this is about to happen because they'd be going and then they'd lift up their head and they'd look around and be like, and you could see like the, the cogs turning and be like, what the heck am I doing out here? <laughs> and then they just like hurl themselves to the ground, be like, nah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. What the heck? And, yeah. you know, I tried to breed that out of my dogs by breeding to, you know, that was one thing I was breeding for was longevity, not just in terms of their overall, you know, their ultimate age, but also their age in the team. And I tried breeding, you know, to, uh, lions with extremely good longevity and still it would come back and bite me. It would, the, mm -hmm. this whole, and, you know, eventually I had to, it was getting so frustrating that I, I, I eventually had to make some tough calls and, you know, remove some dogs from my genetics that I, I liked, but because they went back to that, you know, to the, to that garbage. And I had to kind of not start, 
not start from scratch because I had a lot of, you know, I had the experience necessary to avoid that issue again. And I had the line that I, you know, that other line, but I basically had to scrap an entire line of my dogs because they were, you know, killer until they were seven. And then they were just like worse than useless. And that sucks because how do you you spend five years into them and then go, Oh shit. I mean, and, and I gather from, from what I gather, at least over here, it's probably different where you're at because Europe just in general seems to be more, I don't want to say up and up, but you know, with the bird dogs, with the labs, um, you know, I mean, you're got three grand of genetic testing before you make a cross. Whereas with the hounds, you're not doing OFAs, elbows, hearts, relatively speaking as a group, it just generally doesn't happen. Um, and I gather the sled dogs tend to be about the same way. Um, you know, I'm definitely going to run some just kind of recessive gene type stuff just to make sure there's nothing really big lurking back there, you know, right. get x-rays done. So I know what to expect as far as, especially with me being so far from a vet, let alone my vet of choice, you know, my vet of choice is four and a half hours one way and two and a half hours the other way. And the two and a half hour one is the closest one pretty much that wow. I've got another one that's an hour and a half, but good luck getting in there. And that's pretty much if they're bleeding out type of deal. Um, And the x-rays just give you a little peace of mind too. You know, I think sometimes two people don't think, you know, give that bitch puppy food as she's developing because that's going to supply the calcium she needs for the flat muscles to get through and have a good labor. Um, Mm -hmm. X-rays tell you, especially when you're out rural, like I am, they tell you, okay, no, there was eight puppies in there and I've only got seven on the ground. Something's something's going on. I ran into that this spring. Um, I was whelping a bitch out for someone, not my dog. Uh, it was her first litter. Mm. And she's pretty big. She had three or four and was like, settled down, nursing, totally, totally laid back. And just every now and then I would see her just tense up a little tiny bit. It was, it was just off enough that I was like, something's not quite sitting right. But I'm mm. like, I've got to be imagining it because this is totally like, she's totally chilled out behavior. This is, I don't know, seven, eight hours later. Sure. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to keep watching, going to keep watching, going to keep watching. And I got her, you know, I saw her get up to go, to go pee and squat and kind of strain again. And I, I sent a message to that Beth, it's four and a half hours up there. And I said, Hey, this is, you know, something's just barely off enough that I'm not necessarily comfortable not getting an x-ray done. So haul down to the vet on the way down to the vet. She has one more that's dead, Mm. like three more that are alive somehow come out without sacks, like no idea how these puppies are physically still alive and Mm. then passes another, another deceased one. And it was like, Holy smokes. I'm glad that, you know, you would think a dog like that, you would think would be showing way, you know, should be panting, pacing, getting up, getting down type of deal. Not just like totally chilled out. Like, yep, me and my four babies over here are going to carry on with life now. Um, Ended up, you know, all's well that ends well type of deal and she was fine but the x-ray is definitely worth the mental comfort of knowing what to expect i think so yeah you know it's but you know having said that it too you know we just just had an experience recently where you know it's for that to work it's got to be done so right Mm -hmm. and you know realistically the female if you're going to have the x-rays done, you should hop over the previous meal. Mm -hmm. You know, because if they've got, you know, if they've got a lot of fecal matter or, you know, a full stomach, you can miss some. And we, you know, we've, it's something we say at work a lot is that, you know, okay, this is the number we see, but 
there's there could be another one in there, you know. So yeah, because you know we have, you know, we've experienced, uh, you know, it's where we've said, okay, there's seven, and then, you know, the person's just been like, well, she doesn't, you know, she keeps straining, but she's had seven, you know, and like three days later, come in with a, you know, super super sick dog. But, you know, I. Breeding's just a crapshoot either way half the time. <laughs> a lot of times it is, you know, and, that, and that's that, that's something, you know, to, to, to I think is important to acknowledge here is, you know, we're sitting here and talking about it. We're talking about what's worked for us and kind of the things that we think about. But ultimately it is it is such a crapshoot. You know, I did the worst litter I ever did was on paper to this day, the best litter or that's not true. The second best litter I've ever done Mm -hmm. on paper. And it was a, a female that had done everything that I wanted to do at a very high level uh, that I bought. I spent a ton of money on that dog money. I just did not have and uh, spent just a a ton of money on that dog. (laughs) Uh, to get a hold of her, to get a hold of the genetics, and was like the foundation. This is going to be the foundation of my of my kennel. And went and bred to a dog that had won the Iditarod twice, and was the Golden Harness winner both of those times. So, like the the best lead dog in the race both of those times. And he was everything I wanted. Like, it was just like, yes, this is going to be awesome. And she gave birth to four just like half naked, twitchy little rats that never became anything more than half naked, twitchy little rats. And uh, it was just, just a nightmare scenario where... it was the perfect storm of every single one of her bad qualities, none of her good qualities, and every single one of the father's bad qualities, none of the good qualities, just sort of, you know, boiled down and concentrated into these four <laughs> wretched beings. They, they sucked. <laughs> they sucked so much. Oh yeah, it's there's still a fair amount of luck involved, no matter how much prep and planning and stars lined up, whatever. For sure, for sure. You know, my best, my best. Um, I ended up having two lines that um, I held, I kept pretty separate at the end there when I was consistently and that was when i was starting to consistently produce you know where i'd have a litter of eight pups and seven of them would be what i was looking for um and i i had two lines uh, of dogs that were producing what i was looking for with a, a slight variations based off of you know the one the one line was producing slightly more bulk but um a little bit less brains. The other line was producing just ever so slightly lighter dogs, but producing the brains necessary for the leaders. But, you know, the, the foundation of, you know, the one line was, you know, imported from Alaska, came from Lance Mackey, like, you know, everything on paper looked really, really good. And, you know, the, the foundation stud of that other line who's still alive. He's like 14 now. Um, really good genetics and blah, blah, blah. But ultimately that dog was from an accidental litter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you never, you never know, you know, you have on the one side, uh, a dog that I used you know, years to get a hold of and a lot of resources and time and money and frustration burned a couple friendships and like it was to get, you know, to, to get the, you know, to, to get a hold of it. And, you know, the other one was a, an accidental litter that was throw that was 
produced exactly what I wanted and consistently through exactly what I was looking for. So yeah. it's a, it's a crap shoot. It is a crap shoot. And, you know, one we talked, uh, you know, we, we've touched on, you know, traveling to get a hold of the genetics you want and things like that. But I think there's also probably something to be said for being aware of the conditions where you are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if everybody around you is running a certain type of dog, that might be something to, to at least take pause and consider as to why, mm-hmm. you know, why, you know, what, what do the locals know that you mm-hmm. don't? No, yeah, for sure. And there's things you can do, you know, for say guys who haven't really bred a whole lot. And this is kind of not out of left field, but kind of left field. Um, mm. Just as far as the first time guys that are out there that are like, man, I've, I've never had a litter before. or I've, I've had a couple litters, but I'm still kind of nervous about it. You can... <laughs> Asking opinions on that can be about like asking opinions on what should I feed or what's the best color dog or whatever you're going to. The only thing two guys are going to agree on is that the third guy's wrong. Um, (laughs) But, you know, do some reading up on it. You know, little things like if you have a bitch that's nervous and will not settle down, get her some calcium after she has those pups. Get Not before, but after she has them. Get them some cottage cheese or something that's not going to make her get the runs, but something that'll just kind of help her settle down a little bit and and get Mm -hmm. to nursing. And, you know, some bitches don't like to be messed with when they have pups. Some of them, some of them do just fine. You know, I tend Mm. to half the time they have them at night and I'm not out there. And then, you know, if I think they're going to go during the day, I keep a a decently close eye on them. I kind of come and go. And, you know, if Mm. I see some long umbilical cords or something, I might clip those real quick just to where they don't cause problems. Mm-hmm. Um, but dogs have been having puppies for how many thousands of years and right. they haven't gone extinct yet, but, uh, yeah, just everything you can, you can do to try and get the best outcome. And unfortunately, sometimes it just doesn't work that way, but more often than not, it works out pretty decent. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that that's the truth. I I guess you know it's you know we could have a whole we probably should have a whole another podcast about you know once the breeding is done what then you know just in terms of keeping keeping the female healthy and you know giving you the best chance of having a good healthy litter of pups. Um, yeah, with minimal One. complications. You know, something I see a lot, I shouldn't say I see a lot, but I see a lot of on social media is it's like, man, this bitch's pups are two or three weeks old. She doesn't want anything to do with them. She gets nasty when they want a nurse. Mm -hmm. Check those puppies nails. Cause usually what happens is when those puppies are nursing and they're pushing on her bag, their nails are like little needles and they are poking the hell out of her. And if you take a pair of just nail clippers and cut the little hooks off. She's more than happy to go back to nursing. And people don't think, oh, three weeks old puppies or two week old puppies need their nails done, but they grow like little needles. Oh, they do. They're so sharp. (laughs) They're so sharp. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, just stuff like that. And, you know, so much of what we do uh, in a working dog sense, you know, and the working dog is is experience based. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you said something earlier, you know, better, better bread than bought with a person starting out. I, I totally disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, get, get an adult dog and, mm-hmm. you know, ideally get a couple of them, you know, try a different cup, try a few different things because yeah, the, I don't I don't know, you know, just jumping in with both feet, getting a, you know, a couple of dogs and immediately starting to breed. It just, it's, 
I've never seen that work the way that you would hope that it would. Like it, yeah. it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, you don't have the experience necessary to get, <clears throat> excuse me, to get everything out of those pups. You know, ultimately, I, I, <laughs> I honestly believe that, you know, with every new, every new thing that I've done with the working dogs, there's been a generation of dogs or that first generation of dogs that has, you know, what's been holding them back is me and my lack of experience. You know, you've got to, you've got to start somewhere. And, you know, I don't think that breeding is the right place to start, you know, get the foundations and the basics down first and then consider breeding. Mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, there's, you know, we talk about it being a crapshoot and it's hard to find the real, you know, you, you got to do the work to find the really good hounds. It's so much work to produce the really, really good hounds. And it is so easy to produce just total garbage. And there's so much total garbage out there. And nobody is going to say, this dog, my dog right here, total garbage, you know. Nobody's going to admit the fact that it's it's garbage, but there's so much garbage out there. Yeah. And and it's sad, really, because the one that suffers for it the most is that dog that maybe doesn't have a place to go because he's not what he should be, or hmm. he's the one who ultimately suffers for it the most in a right. lot of ways. Yeah, or the, or the, the the guy, you know, the new the new person, the new guy or gal in the sport. You know, being stuck with dogs that just are not, are not what they want. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy right now with the hounds. You know, I've got, I have two that, you know, I could call, mm -hmm. but it's kind of, it's, it's either that or just kind of keep, keep them here. Cause I, I wouldn't be able to move those dogs on and expect them to do to end up in any kind of good situation because their, their bottom line, just not good enough. Yeah. And that's not necessarily, at least with one, that's not necessarily their own fault. That That's a lot of that was a man-made issue, not from you. So it's right. You feel kind of like a slime ball making them, you know? Yeah. You know, and it's, you know, a, uh, but, but again, it's, it's another, it's another reason why it's a good idea to be really deliberate and do the, you know, do your due diligence when you're breeding. Cause you know, it's the, you know, I think genetically Vipi was a, I, I've seen enough moments of brill brilliance in her to be able to catch glimpses of what she was actually capable of. Mm -hmm. If she had not been gotten the start that she'd gotten and had not been bred before she was a year old, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it's one of those things where, you know, I've not saying it's the right thing to do. I've chosen to just kind of sleep in the bed that I've, made and I, I went into it knowing too that I was yeah. taking some chances and you know I had to start somewhere yeah and you know I'm still dealing with the 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 fallout from starting a totally different type of working dog than I'd ever started before and that you know it's the the consequences of it for for me anyway you know I'm not saying it's the right thing to do for everybody else but for me it made sense to just kind of hold on to them and you know hunt them with my eyes wide open, fully aware that we're not going to get anything done today. <laughs> you know? and, and you're at a disadvantage too, though, because you don't have the ease that we have of, Oh, just dump them with the pack. They'll figure it out. 
Right. You, you got to work for whatever you want and then dealing with a dog who already has some psychological Baloney. barriers there. I mean, I'm, mm. you're never going to hear me say a bad thing about giving her grace. I probably tend to do that. You know, I got a couple cases that it's, well, I mean, you know about it. It's one of those deals where it's like this dog, I'm this dog's only option type of right. deal. And it's not saying the whole pack is made up of that. I just, ha- I just have a charity case here and there that I pick up. <laughs> off the side of the damn road uh, right. and right. then, you know, tries to eat people. Um, <laughs> right. So it's, you know, but it's a matter of what you can live with, I guess. Exactly. But you know, but that's, that's the thing too. It's like this, this VHB dog, she threw good pups with that, with that litter that she had way back when through good mm-hmm. pups, her genetics are, excellent her father is just an insanely good dog and like i said i've seen moments of brilliant brilliance in in Vitby where she's done something that it's like oh wow i didn't realize she was even capable of that followed yeah. by you know a, an endless string of moments of just complete you know idiocy mm-hmm. but you know even though the genetics are good, even though she's had a litter before that turned out pretty good, I'm never ever going to breed to that dog. I'm never going to mm-hmm. breed to her because she is not what I want. Right. You know, at her potential, she might be, but it's not, I'm not willing to take that, that chance. And it's, it ended up being why I went with the, the dog that I've got now, that Vida. Mm-hmm dog you mean the horse the horse you have now the, the horse that i've got now <laughs> the uh the number one shoe mule that i that i've yeah. got right now yeah it's like it's like fo- traditional fox hunting combined you can ride the dog while you're chasing the fox ride instead the of riding the horse it's, chasing the, the dog exactly chasing the fox. <laughs> exactly my 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 hellhound yeah but you know it's why i ended up going with her because i knew her parents I knew her parents' siblings. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I knew their uncle, you know, aunts, uncles, the whole, the whole family was right there. And I could see that they were doing it the way I wanted to do it. Yeah. And obviously he's having great success with this program. You know, I'd, oh, yeah. I'd, I'd say there's not, I'd say you could point at any dog in Eric's kennel and say, all right, what's that flaw? And he's not going to have to think about it very long. No, I mean, and and that's 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 what's really interesting about about him, and I, I I need to get him on the podcast. I've been saying it for years, and we're, we're we talk on the phone like a couple, you know, at least once a week. So it's ridiculous that he hasn't been on. But the guy is so aware of the fact that his name is attached to his dogs, his genetics, and that if he is not honest about about it, if he is like that that is going to come back and bite him. Mm -hmm. So in terms of just like integrity, when it comes to his genetics, integrity, when it comes to, you know, just integrity, it's, it's one of the reasons why I went with, with a dog from him was that, you know, the guy is like, he's, he's so honest. He'll be like, you know, we'll be sitting and he'll be like, you know, we'll be talking about a dog and I'll be like, oh, he's a little bit, you know, he'll like list off things that he's, that he wishes the dog did better. And then the dog will just be like burning up everybody else that's, that's, yeah. out, that's out there, like way out performing anything else. And he, he's like, you know, he's like, well, he's not the best one I've got. And it's like, well, damn, man, you're, you're crappiest, you know, you're the crappiest dog at Eric's place is way better than anything else I've hunted with. So it's like, well, I feel like this is probably a good bet. And you've got to make sure too, that you don't, you strive for for perfection, but you also realize perfection doesn't exist. And sometimes you have to be okay with 99% perfect rather than chasing rainbows that aren't there, you know? Right. It's striving for perfection, but having that be, having that be the point, not Mm -hmm. achieving perfection, but trying to, you know, always improve, 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 you know, even by, you know, infinitesimal increments, but shoot, shoot for the moon and land amongst the stars. Right. (laughs) I guess. Yeah. You know, because, um, and then there's, 
that's another thing too, is, you know, we're talking about doing the breedings ourselves and stuff like that. There's so many, there's so many good breeders out there <laughs> that, uh, I do not, I don't see the point in doing because people say, oh, I wanted to save money. Oh, it's so expensive to go and buy a pup from whoever. But by the time you're done, you know, by the time that female is, is done and those pups are weaned and, you know, you might be able to sell a couple and break even, but you're, you're, gonna, you're about going to break even. Like it's not, you know, especially in the hunting dog world, unless, I don't know. You know, or I, I guess in the mixed breed hunting dog world, you're not going to be able to ask for $10,000 for a pup. And you're going to take some time off that bitch. I mean, you're going to take a little bit out of her. It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, and I kind of, I don't want back to back litters just because of the climate we live in some, but I go back and forth between, you know, You've got studies showing back-to-back breedings are better. You've got studies showing that a year in between is better or two years in between is better. Um, Mm. If you look at the way dogs are physiological made, if you're looking at coyotes, yeah, they're meant to breed pretty much back-to-back in theory. Yep. But dogs aren't coyotes. And I mean, sometimes you just got to do what works for you because you can drive yourself crazy trying to go by everybody else's standards when in all reality oh, everybody sure. else isn't who you're trying to please i mean you got to go with what you want at the same time it's exactly i think i think that's a good note to to end on is is you got to do what works for you it's like i said you got to breed if you're going to breed it's got to be you've got to breed to dogs that are doing things doing what you want to be doing the way you want to be doing it yeah And one, I guess, one last little note that'll preface into our next one of after the tie and beyond. Mm. I see a lot of folks say, my bitch is overdue by five days. You have to remember, due date is from ovulation and conception, not tie date. That could give you five days either way, (laughs) whatever you think it is. They're not going to set up camp in there and come out with collars on and everything she's she's gonna get rid of them eventually when they're ready Ooh, she'll right, have them. Exa- exactly <laughs> <laughs> come out with her eyes open with a full set of teeth yeah pretty much yeah. <sighs> oh god it's it's yeah no it's true it's um but we should do that uh we should do that podcast as well because there's a lot of uh i don't know there's a lot that goes into getting a female and pups, you know, through a pregnancy and pups on the ground. Uh, you know, if you don't do anything, it'll probably be fine, but yeah. you may not, you may not get the, uh, you know, a, a little bit of effort goes a long way in terms of just kind of, you know, return, getting higher returns on your efforts. Yeah. And safety nets. Yeah. Heck we've talked about starting yeah. puppies and training puppies and everything, but now how to get puppies. <laughs> right. We've now talked we about old, old dogs. <laughs> now we just need to kind of fill in the blanks here. Exactly. Yeah. Now it's, it's, uh, it's endlessly interesting. The whole, the whole breeding thing. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I got to a point where I was doing what was working for me in the, uh, in the sled dog, in the sled dog world. And, am aware enough about the how difficult breeding is to have not even attempted it in mm-hmm. the hound world yet because i am still not at a point where i feel like i have the information that i need to be able to make a um to be able to go into it educated enough about what my options are and what i'm going for Mm -hmm. Um, I'm getting close. I will say that I'm getting close, but yeah, I'm still not there. There's a reason I've been doing this for six years and still have not had a litter. Um, Mm -hmm. it's because I'm, I'm gathering information and you know, if you know, experience. Yeah. You're still figuring out how to get what you want. 
not just how to get what I want, but I'm still figuring out what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's um, which is what makes it fun and exciting for me anyway. But yeah, it's um, yeah, no, it's pretty interesting. For sure. Pretty yeah, we'll definitely have to do a follow up on all the maternity tricks and tips and <laughs> how to yeah, not drive would... yourself crazy for 58 to 62 days. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, anytime. I always have a blast. It's always fun. Yeah. Man, I love that sound. <laughs>